we have assembled a group of local cannabis alliances and associations to share their insights about how they're advancing the interests of the legitimate and responsible cannabis industry in cities across California to create economic development and implement best practices to move this industry forward. So first, I am uh, happy to introduce Joe Rogaway, the managing partner at Rogaway Law Group, who is here today representing the Long Beach Collective Association. Uh, widely recognized as a thought leader in the cannabis industry, Joe has dedicated his academic and professional career to cannabis law reform, regulation, and the representation of businesses. As a trial attorney, Joe conducted dozens of jury, bench, and administrative trials. As a political advocate, Joe was the author and co-proponent of several state ballot initiatives seeking to end cannabis prohibition in California. Today, Joe leads the firm dedicated to assisting cannabis and hemp businesses with their corporate compliance, licensing, IP, and litigation needs. Mm -hmm. Joe's here today uh, with the LBCA, where he's worked to mon modernize the city's cannabis tax structure to help widen the scope of local cannabis economic development. This fall, Joe will also be the lead instructor for cannabis industry curriculum at Long Beach City College as their first cannabis education program, which is very exciting. Welcome, Joe. Next, we have Jackie Jackpot Subek, who is an advocate, consultant, and consumption lounge owner and the CEO of Hey Jackpot, um, a lifestyle cannabis brand focusing on business consulting. Uh, for nearly two years, she was the vice chair uh, of Women Grow Los Angeles, developing and producing one of the most successful cannabis B2B networking events in the LA area, now rebranded as Connecting Cannabis. She worked diligently on Prop 64, in California and continues her advocacy by working closely with the state's Bureau of Cannabis Control on licensing and regulations, as well as locally with cities including West Hollywood and Beverly Hills to help create fair, equitable, and inclusive cannabis policy for everyone. Welcome, Jackie. Next, we have Sean Kelly Rye, the founder and president of the Silicon Valley Cannabis Alliance. Sean has worked in the public and private arena, shaping public, public policy for more than 20 years. His experience in government affairs and economic development includes budget and policy aid in local government. Sean founded the SVCA after recognizing a need for regional collaboration at the local level. He's helped 50% of the existing cannabis businesses in San Jose secure their licenses and SVCA helps operators grow responsibly, increase revenue and help build strategic partnerships. Welcome Sean. Next, we have Jocelyn Kane, the vice president of the Coachella Valley Cannabis Alliance Network. Uh, there, um, she's the former executive director of San Francisco's Entertainment Commission and was charged with ensuring the health and vitality of indoor and outdoor entertainment venues and outdoor events in San Francisco. She also served as San Francisco's Cannabis Legalization Task Force to bring fair and sensible policy to cannabis regulations. Jocelyn is now working as a consultant to the cannabis industry through her company, 24 Palm Trees LLC, assisting companies in every part of the supply chain with understanding California's rules on compliance, license, licensing, and permits on both the state and local level. Located in Palm Springs, she is now the legislative director at CB Can, the Valley's only cannabis trade association. Um, and she's also on the CB Can board of directors. Welcome, Jocelyn. Last but certainly not least, we have James Anthony, the principal at Anthony Law Group. Uh, who will be moderating this conversation. Uh, I'm just gonna take a quick breath. Whew, long bios. <laughs> All right, James is a cannabis attorney and political strategist, and he's an expert in legal, regulatory, and government affairs matters affecting the cannabis industry. In 2006, James started his private law practice, which was the first in California to specialize in civil and land use matters related to cannabis. James was a former Oakland deputy city attorney with a passion for drug policy activism and has also served on the board of law enforcement against prohibition. In his book, The Cannabis Manifesto, Harborside founder and industry icon Steve D'Angelo calls James a brilliant strategist and steadfast advocate without whom Harborside might never have it been licensed. James serves on the board of directors for the CCIA and is a longtime faculty member at Oak Street Dam University. University. And as James wrote to us in a planning email, he says, you see the title of the panel, Cannabis Friendly Cities. Well, that's nice. And sometimes to make friends, first you have to get into a little scrap in the playground of local politics. So James, please take it away. Let's get scrappy. 
Thank you so much, Aria um, Pua. The, this is, looks has been amazing. I heard people telling me what a great time they had yesterday. Uh, it is wonderful that we have 115 people. I assume that all of you with your cameras off uh, already stood up and stretched and moved your bodies around. Uh, feel free to do that. Ooh, make a noise, move your body. Uh, um, you're on mute. I can't hear you groaning uh, or making noises. Uh, do so. um, and I don't mind people moving. I don't know. I'm actually in the middle of a, uh, a four day uh, Zoom meditation retreat. And we got all these instructions about not moving, you know, because you're looking at all these people meditating. It's incredibly boring. I like to turn my screen off, but you move, do whatever you want. Um, I think we just jump right into it. I'd love to hear uh, from the panelists, um, some of whom I know, some of whom are, are new to me. So I, I'm excited. Uh, to hear people's stories, war stories from local government, uh, keeping in mind uh, the great uh, frame um, that uh, Hua and the team have put together, you know, that we should be present for this moment. Um, <clears throat> what we do together uh, matters. Um, to participate, you need to really tell your stories. I encourage uh, difference and dissent um, and you know, the last time I checked, California has 482 incorporated cities, 58 counties. That makes about 540 local governments. They are not all the same, as you may have noticed. Um, why don't we go ahead and start with, I don't know, Jackie, I'd love to hear from you if you're ready to have uh, some words for us. Oh, one, one thing, time check. Aria, what, are we good till 2.15, 2.30? What are we doing? Yes, I believe you are on till 2.30. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I just wanna first take a minute and thank Hua and Aria for such an excellent, excellent job. This has been really an incredible, uh, shall we call it a conference, virtual conference, um, all since yesterday so far. So really well done and thank you to, to all of you for putting this together. Um, yeah, so local. Local is kind of a big deal these days, right? Because as we've all been talking about, we want to get rid of local control, but meanwhile, locals still manage a lot of the control. Um, I'm based in West Hollywood, and for those of you who have been following along, um, we've had a lot of local battles here in West Hollywood. Um, we recently, so I'm a consumption lounge owner, um, and we recently, um, actually earlier this year, we wrote a ballot measure and we got our signatures before COVID and we qualified for, the, for this November ballot in order to um, fix a lot of the problems that happened um, based from originally from, from 2018, uh, we had a merit-based uh, application system uh, that was okay, but it had some problems and um, a year went by and we weren't able to solve any of the policy problems. So we sort of went to ballot measure and um, turned out to you know, work to our benefit to go down that path because we were able to force the hand of the local officials to pay attention to us. They couldn't ex you know, continue to avoid us from city council meetings. They now actually had to pay attention. So um, you know, we, uh, we were able to really sit down and talk about that and realized that going to November, this particular November um, was probably not a really good idea. Nobody really wanted to be in a cannabis battle in this November. Um, and so we ended up uh, working together with the city and coming up with a actual settlement and solving most of our policy problems. And so now we were able to withdraw our ballot measure um, because we were able to solve you know, the bulk of, of these issues and move forward. And it, it's been a long process, but we finally, sort of got what we needed to be able to have a viable business and be able to know like everything from basic stuff, like what kind of rent uh, lease can we take out? Um, so, you know, so we're, yeah, we're in, we're in much better shape than we were, you know, just a few months ago. That, that's great that you were able to um, uh, qualify the measure, get it put on the ballot uh, and then negotiate uh, a settlement um, with your local right. government. That's relatively new. It's only been in the last few years that the legislature uh, amended the elections code uh, to allow us to um, cut a deal and withdraw uh, a measure from the ballot. So I'm, I'm so happy to hear that people are using that. 
Um, let's see, who do we have up next? Um, Joe, why, why don't we hear something from you? What's new and exciting in your world? Um, well, hey, with that, uh, good to see everybody. James, always a pleasure to, to see you. Um, and yeah, uh, so a few different things. Um, very active uh, here in Sonoma County. Uh, so similarly, we did also um, take the approach of filing um, and basically have been working with the Board of Supervisors over the last year and a half. Um, the ballot initiative was essentially a hedge uh, to be able to just make sure that we had the issues that we needed to be addressed, actually be addressed. Um, but it looks like we're going to be able to accomplish a fair amount of what we wanted to do, especially with regards to cultivation um, through the legislative process. So we're really working very closely with the electeds. Uh, we have good relationships there, which is I think really important to, to maintain those relationships. Um, and of course, like all other efforts that we have done that end up being uh, successful, the main argument that resonates with the electeds is economic development. Um, it's, you know, the issue of social justice, the issue of safe access. Those are obviously important issues that we all believe in. The most effective argument, though, in interface with electeds uh, that I've found is economic development. So here in particular, Sonoma County has gone through just a brutal um, several years since legalization. Historically, there has been such a vibrant cannabis industry here. There was just a lot of amazing craft cultivators that were basically all precluded from participating in the legal industry because of the county's uh, land use and, and zoning rules that, that made it incredibly restrictive to get permits, um, which of course means that without permits, they can't be licensed. Uh, to put it into perspective, the county had uh, this process in place where the pre-existing cultivators could continue to cultivate sort of on this interim basis called penalty relief while uh, the, the permits were being processed. And since uh, 2017, when that program started to today's date, there's been only a handful of permits that have been processed. And we represent you know, a number of people that have unfortunately remained in penalty relief all the way through. Um, and what that means is that uh, because there's no permit that there cannot be any sort of building of, of ag exempt buildings, for example, for like processing harvesting activities, there can't be an increase whatever the canopy was for cultivation that existed prior to 2017, which of course was an entirely different paradigm when we're talking about the old collective model where 200 plants was a pretty robust farm uh, by local standards. You know, now we're looking at, you know, acre farms that our local businesses are competing with in other parts of the state. So it's um, really incongruent and it really undermines the competitiveness of the local craft cultivators. Um, and so there's been some real policy imperatives that we wanted to, to implement here. Um, it looks like things are going in the right direction, but of course I'm sitting here in like a giant ashtray because of the ongoing fires. And so there's other priorities. Cannabis has been something, and, and this there, there is an important nexus here where it seemed like we were gonna get some additional progress in 2017, and then we had the Tubbs fire. It seemed like we were gonna get progress in 2018 and 2019. There were fires that impacted then as well. And of course this year, there's been two major fires. And so all of that stuff just draws the attention away from the electeds. And it's important to, to find opportunities to bring them back to this issue because for all of us that are participating here, cannabis is the most important thing in our lives professionally. It is, it consumes us. It is something that we put so much energy and intentionality into. For the electeds, this is just one small issue. And so the way for, I think, the, the best messaging to be conveyed that we've seen um, both here uh, and other places in Long Beach, that is what, what's meaningful there, is the economic development argument. So just shifting gears briefly to Long Beach, one of the things that LBCA did so well over the last year there, and I think this may be the only example throughout the state of California, was to actually reduce the tax rate for supply chain businesses from 6% down to 1%. That was just such a significant victory for the local businesses. And it's something that, that makes all the difference as those of you who are in the audience 
um, are well aware of the sort of compressed margins in the cannabis industry, the difference between 1% tax and 6% tax can be the difference in viability. And so what Long Beach is seeing is not just having that relief available for the businesses, but with the dumpster fire that is Los Angeles, a lot of businesses that are re-domiciling their activities to avail themselves of a better regulatory framework. And so unfortunately, we are in this, uh, this paradigm of local control, which I believe is really the original sin of cannabis legalization. It's something that I fought really hard against in the efforts that I've been involved in, going all the way back to Prop 19 with uh, myself and Richard Lee. That's where that concept started. That concept is actually why I left that effort and why at the time I was glad that that effort went down in flames. But the residue of Prop 19 of having local control control carry through to the present. And it's something that was heavily negotiated amongst the different efforts in 2016. It was something that in my role for the effort I was a part of, very much pushing back against that, but there wasn't any stopping it. There was this belief within the Prop 64 campaign that it was important to get local control out there so that you could hopefully garner the support from like the League of Cities and you know police unions and things like that. Of course, that was never going to be the case. It was an unrealistic expectation that I disagreed with strongly at the time. And of course, it played out as we all know that it has. And so one of the things that I think is obviously relevant to this panel and relevant to the last panel as well, is that a lot of these problems derive from local control. And that the more that we can do to eviscerate that in practice, and the more that we can do to have some sort of equanimity amongst California's 500 plus municipalities, that is going to be what resolves really most of these issues to the extent that they can be resolved. So I guess I would just start my comments there and then pass it back to you. That's great. Uh, thanks, Joe. I, I wanna, I've made myself a note. I wanna come back to this issue of uh, places that have lowered taxes. I think there there may have been a couple of others, um, and, and I'm going to want to hear about that. So we'll follow up on that. And um, I, I think absolutely we're all with you that um, this dual licensing local control thing uh, was was doomed to failure. So um, here, here we are. Uh, the CCIA legislative agenda, the top priorities are lowering the taxes and expanding retail, which means you know, doing something about local control to get uh, more local permits. Um, Jocelyn, what's new and exciting? Um, I'm looking forward to hear about uh, Coachella. Yeah, hi, thank you to Meadow, Meadowlands, and David and Aria and everybody um, for inviting me on here. We're the little known uh, secret that Coachella Valley is actually fairly progressive in terms of, of cannabis. Uh, but the lay of the land ultimately is there's nine small cities that make up the Coachella Valley and only five of them uh, allow uh, commercial cannabis activity. Uh, the majority of them allow the like most of the supply chain. Palm Desert's a little sketchy. Um, Desert Hot Springs was one of the earliest cities to jump on this. They actually came back from bankruptcy uh, I won't say on the back of, but through the work of the cannabis industry and, and bringing folks to Desert Hot Springs. And they have been the most progressive in terms of uh, up to a point in taxation. They have zero taxation on manufacturing, um, which kind of can skew things, but um, we're working hard with them to, to lower taxes. And in fact, uh, we're doing the CVCAN is the Coachella Valley Cannabis Alliance Network. We're the Chamber of Commerce for Weed. And we are doing our third year of Canna Cannabis Forums this cycle uh, so that we can educate all of the folks who are running, whether they win or not, on the cannabis industry uh, in all of those five cities. Uh, we were super close to getting a sixth. Um, but they were not responsive. So in any event, uh, we do this every year as an educational tool. We do not, um, uh, you know, tell people who to vote for uh, at all, but we do it again as an educational tool so that these people who are running for office in these really small 
cities. And I come from, like you heard originally, uh, 30 years living in San Francisco, working for the city of San Francisco, which is a, you know, rather large. And these are teeny tiny cities of 40,000 or less. Uh, and, and to talk about people who don't understand an industry, we've got a lot of them. So uh, we're working hard as an organization to educate folks uh, and banging away in particular on certain cities in terms of, of taxation because it's a, literally a mile from one city to the next. So it does have a great impact if they don't have parity uh, or parity with places just down the road or up the hill or over the hill, right? So, um, so it, it, it's something that we're gonna talk about in the next few weeks and everyone's invited and I'll put the link in the chat to listen to our cannabis forums because I go hard. I don't fuck around, excuse my French. Uh, because why not? What the hell? I'm a cannabis lady and down here everybody knows I'm that friend that they call when they wanna go to a dispensary and they don't know what they're doing and they're scared. Um, but anyway, uh, I guess that's a good answer for now. That, that is great. And, and it reminds me that I do wanna come back and, and talk about the, the significance of the size of your city and how that relates to your, your political options, uh, including ballot measures. I also wanna talk at some point a little bit about elections and, um, and you know, do you endorse or not endorse? Do you educate candidates? Uh, I'd love to hear more about all of that. I think um, last but not least, uh, were there four panelists besides me? Uh, Sean uh, Collie Ray is uh, one of the most astute uh, local government uh, activists uh, that I know that I've had the pleasure to work with a lot uh, around um, the city of San Jose and Santa Clara County. Hi, Sean. Hey, James, how are you? Uh, Hua, thank you, and Aria also for, for letting me participate. Uh, I, I, Local control, as it was envisioned, was about blending into the neighborhoods. Local control, as it's working now, is shit. I'm just going to say it, right? It's shit. It's not, it's, it's legalized extortion of an industry by the people who lost. That's what the hell this is, right? It's the minority showing up, bullying the city council, and saying, you need 10% extort these people for 10% because we lost, because we were too lazy to vote or because we don't like cannabis or we bought the bullshit 80 years of propaganda against cannabis. So how's that for starting out, James, with the, uh, we're trying to shake it up a little bit. That's what you asked for. So, and, and, and I, I enjoy working with the locals, but I hate working with locals that talk about, want to relitigate Prop 64. I'm sorry, we won you lost, you want equity? Forget paying people for equity. You want equity? More licenses for everyone, period. More licenses for everyone. You will get black, brown, women. You, they will look like liquor stores, right? You will get a cross section of people. You'll get all races, colors, sizes. Let people have licenses and let the market demand be met. And the hell with this nonsense and keep local control to what it was supposed to be. Let it fit in the communities in a reasonable, sensible way. Get rid of the other nonsense that they call local control, but is really just a way to kind of uh, bully an industry that, that they just for one reason or another don't wanna deal with. Well, uh, that was a great first round. When you see me staring off to this side, I have the um, chat uh, box uh, <clears throat> up on a, my little laptop screen. So I am keeping an eye on that. Um, and um, uh, somebody's um, interested in the town of Truckee, which I think is not an incorporated city. That's part of unincorporated El Dorado County. So um, if you're... Uh, if you want to help uh, uh, Jacob organize, uh, you know, the uh, Board of Supervisors, uh, I, I will say this, and, and, and I don't know how many of you work in, in counties. I know Sean does a little bit. Joe was talking about Sonoma County. Uh, the thing about counties, so just so that we're all on the same page, is <clears throat> under the California Constitution, they all have five members, except San Francisco, which is the exception to every rule. We'll just put them on the side. Uh, 
five supervisors by geographical districts. And the way they usually set this up is if there's one supervisor uh, who has something proposed in their district, um, whatever they want. If they want it in their district, it'll be five zero yes. If they don't want it in their district, it'll be five zero no. And they kind of back each other up that way. That, that, that's a common pattern there. So, so something to think about in terms of um, El Dorado County um, or any county for that matter. Anybody got thoughts about county politics generally and how that kind of thing works? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that my experience is that cities are far easier to work with. Counties are big, the constituencies are broader and harder to juggle, and, and all those dynamics that you're describing are present. Cities, a lot of times, you know, they're obviously um, typically going to be smaller. There's, there's just more of an opportunity for that type of sort of direct interaction to be meaningful. Um, so I found that it's always preferable to work on a city by city basis. And if you're looking to address something at the county level, um, I would just stack up permissive cities. I, I think that that's, that that's a good way to think about it and, and really be utilizing that argument of uh, economic development because counties typically do it all wrong. I mean, it's hard to think of very many counties in California that are doing it right. Probably Humboldt is one of the best that is doing it on a county level. Um, but I mean, look at all of the major metropolitan areas and the counties that they're within. You know, there's not a lot there. Even the city and county of San Francisco, for as progressive as it is and as much access as there is, there's still so many problems with it. And uh, I think that the equity program is abysmal there. I, I also was involved in some of those early task force meetings as they're trying to prepare for legalization, those were all like, I think, uh, fairly positive. Um, but then when all of this stuff was being voted on, we had uh, just like literally bus loads of people getting bus in from the sunset, the outer sunset and the outer Richmond, like literally in like tour buses to go there and just stack up 200 speakers to say no MCD, one after another, no MCD, no MCD. And it got to the point in San Francisco um, that the electeds got sick of hearing about it and, and they were just rolling their eyes by the end of it. Um, but it was like a very powerful tool that, that came about for people that did want to sort of relitigate these issues and then utilize the concept of local control to really be um, local prohibition. Because I think that the term local control is, is a misnomer. All it is is finding out ways to carve out prohibition. And so and that's where you see, what is it, 80% of the state of California um, is in the realm of prohibition. Maybe those kinds of things will be reconsidered now that there are budgetary shortfalls. But the problem is, is that there's also this misconception that the cannabis industry is a gold mine. The cannabis industry can fund those budget shortfalls. And so they should overtax the cannabis industry. And, and that is a problem that is, I think, pervasive across the state and something that as each one of us is interfacing with our electeds and doing whatever type of GR work that we're doing, to be able to make sure to say early and often that the cannabis industry is not that. Whatever they perceive that it is as being like this golden ticket for people, that's, that's not what it is. And even things that are well-meaning uh, that in terms of like provisions of equity programs, like in San Francisco, having this, this prohibition on selling somebody's interest in the business for 10 years who's an equity applicant is a terrible, terrible idea. It's awful policy. It just really diminishes the value that, that people have to look at, but it's well-intentioned. So I think that it's about dealing with some of those issues. Thank, thank you, Joe. And, and um, a lot of excellent points there. I think to kind of uh, keep us lively and interactive, uh, I'm going to ask the panelists or whoever's speaking like, make a point or two and then pause. And does anybody have anything that um, they want to respond to Joe or that came up for them either about uh, counties or some of the other issues that um, um, he raised? Go ahead, jump on in there. Um, I'll just say that Riverside County uh, is large and the Coachella Valley is just a portion of it. And really our only outdoor growing is in unincorporated Riverside County. And we've had some, and we continue to have battles around Anza uh, uh, That's and accurate, ladies. Shut up. <laughs> Thanks, Dana. Uh, 
uh, but anyway, uh, we ha we have tried to work up there uh, and and do our better work in the local jurisdictions. Yeah, this is Sean. Um, you know, James, I'll tell you, it, you know this, uh, counties are much tougher to deal with than cities. I mean, with cities, you can at least have conversations with folks, counties, uh, especially like Santa Clara County. Uh, you know, when COVID hit back in April, I had to call you, I had to call a lot of the activists in the cannabis community, Ellen at uh, California Normal, uh, the ASA and everyone else to try to beat back the county from stopping the uh, San Jose dispensaries from having adult use. Um, so counties are, you know, to Joe's point, are very difficult to deal with. I, I would, especially my experience in Northern California, um, I, I'd much rather deal with individual cities um, that have needs than, than counties. Yeah, my, my heart goes out uh, to the, the people in, in Truckee. Um, you know, it is definitely part of the, uh, the, the legacy historical uh, cannabis culture. And, uh, you know, how many cities are there even in El Dorado County, this South Lake Tahoe, Placerville, I don't know, maybe something else down there almost in Sacramento. Um, and so, you know, politically, um, I'm not sure who the supervisor is for Truckee, but if it's possible to establish a relationship with that person, uh, that's going to be, um, you know, your, your best bet for getting anything going there. And if the door is slammed in your face there, you, you got a problem. Um, let's go back to th this issue of who has reduced taxes. Joe mentioned that Long Beach came down from 6% to 1% on all the supply chain. I think I got that right. And I remember seeing that and sharing it with, with other cities uh, as I will continue to. Um, Oakland made some kind of token effort, but it's still, I think, higher than almost everybody. Um, and, you know, they're boiling the frog backwards. They're starting high and they're coming down over the next couple of three years, which is ridiculous. Um, who else has, um, has got a, an example either of taxes being reduced or taxes being done the right way to boil the frog, where you start really low uh, Jocelyn mentioned 0% on manufacturing. Um, I know that also uh, Santa Rosa, maybe Joe, that's something you can jump in on. Um, so who else has brought them down or, or who just has low taxes because they're doing it right? I'll, I'll step in, although we don't have low taxes. Um, West Hollywood passed a measure um, last year, I guess, um, that just established a seven and a half percent local tax. Um, and part of the issue with it is that they never convened the stakeholders in that discussion. They just arbitrarily came up with this number of seven and a half percent. And we went back to them and said, hey, you know, that's kind of unrealistic and maybe we should create some sort of a ramp up. Um, some, somewhat similar to, I believe, what San Francisco did, where they maybe started at two and a half percent based it on net revenues. And then as you hit certain milestones in revenues, your tax increased. That makes a lot more sense. But as opposed to just having your hand out for an extra seven and a half percent right off the bat um, before businesses have even had a chance to get started. So, you know, um, I think that that as we're talking about local control and just the locals and their involvement in general, is if you do have an opportunity to get in there and talk to your local officials before they pass a tax, before they put something on the ballot, um, that's that's when you want to do that. You kind of want to do it when they, when they aren't even having the conversation because once they start to get a number in their minds and they start to see what kind of potential revenue that's going to bring in, they're never going to let go of that. So that's what happened here in West Hollywood. And um, you know, as far as county stuff, it's like we have in LA County, we have 88 cities here. There's just no way to get everybody on board. So it really is a city by city situation, uh, uh, you know, at least here in, in LA County. Yeah, and down here, again, the cities are so close together. Uh, we've had no success in retail, but we started, we're starting to have conversations around changing the way uh, the cultivation tax works from square foot to, you know, other calculations and then you know, talking about what area is counted in that square footage, like canopy and whatnot. Uh, so it's a little like more parsed, but we also do our best work when we're able to say, look, 
this city did this. Don't you want to catch up with them? Because, right, there's nine of these cities and five, they're all scrunched together. And so it's literally so close that someone can move their business uh, or not open in your city and just go down the road, roll down the road. And so they know, and they're always worried and looking at the other guys. So we try to use that to our advantage. And, and just if, I, if I might just tag on a little bit, um, just about LA County, I just want to let everybody know that LA County has a ban on all things cannabis right now. So unincorporated LA County is out of luck. There's absolutely nothing they can do. Anybody that's outside of the 88 cities. And, you know, we have 1.8 1 million people that live in unincorporated LA counties that have no access of any kind within their area. And a lot of the jurisdictions in LA County, like on the 605 corridor, are super duper corrupt. Um, and so there is just, if, you know, see the, the issues that pop up in the news with elected officials um, getting arrested and stuff. A lot of those are just really small cities on the 605 corridor. So they, you know, they do allow for commercial businesses or are successful businesses that are there, but um, there's a lot of pay to play. And, you know, there's, you know, a real fine line, I think, between making sure to be engaged and making sure that you're at the table so that you're not on the menu, so to speak. Um, but also, you know, resisting some of these impulses for smaller jurisdictions to do sketchy things. Hey, James, yeah. uh, one last point. Go ahead. Uh, Redwood City is actually going to start, uh, they're hopefully going to pass their ordinance on October 12th, and uh, their taxes should start at around 4%. Uh, and I expect a lot of San Mateo County, as it starts to open, because they need money, uh, San Bruno is probably next after uh, Redwood City and maybe other some of the other smaller cities. Uh, so if the benchmark is going to be four in San Mateo County, hopefully that'll force other cities to try to compete and be at or below four. Um, when you go south to San Jose, it's 10. But when that may change as they start seeing some of their cannabis industry uh, and customers going, uh, you know, 30 minutes away without traffic to Redwood City. That, that's great. Uh, I just want to note that there's some um, great um, uh, examples in the chat box. Um, Aria, who are, are you guys going to save those and make them available? Um, uh, yes. Okay, good. Um, I, because I, I would love to have this stuff. Uh, Santa Rosa, we all know, is good. Emeryville is good. Um, Vallejo came down a little from 10 to seven, Sean might point that out to San Jose. Uh, Jocelyn made a, a great point, which is that when you have a bunch of little cities kind of clustered up, they are competing with each other and they will um, directly compete with each other um, uh, for to steal tax revenue from each other. For, so local governments get 1% of the sales tax, right? Of whatever it is, 7%, 8%, one point of that comes back to the local government. Uh, and, you know, a, a guy who used to be the revenue uh, director or revenue staffer for the city of San Jose, who came and worked for Oakland uh, for a while, uh, about 10 years ago, said an interesting thing to me on uh, the city hall steps, a guy named Dave McPherson. Um, Dave said to me that, yeah, you know, we'll cut a deal with a retailer, like if, like if they're making a delivery, you know, where did that sale occur, right? So if the business is in San Jose, but they deliver to Campbell, who's going to get that one point? And Dave said that he would cut deals with uh, retailers like, well, you know, just make sure that that sale terminated in San Jose and that is therefore attributable to San Jose, and I will kick you back a quarter point. Okay, so that mentality is what goes on between cities competing for revenue. And you are, so you are absolutely always in a good position to point out to them, you know, I think of like Fairfield's got applications out now, Vacaville's gonna come behind them. And, you know, I can never tell if I'm in Fairfield or Vacaville, I'm sure there's a way to know, I, I haven't figured it out. Um, and yeah, that they need to be clear that a business can be anywhere in either of those cities and that they will go where, where the tax is, you know, uh, significantly better because a gross receipts tax is, is ruinous anyway. And a point or two or three or four makes, makes a huge difference. I want to um, 
move to this thing that some of you have alluded to that the cities are all broke and they're looking for money. And so they're gonna suddenly become open-minded about cannabis. There's a bunch of um, tax measures on the ballot uh, <clears throat> in the election that's going on now or coming up in November. Um, that is a sign that they're about to, um, you know, start doing some regulations and they're mostly up to tax measures. So then they're gonna to have to decide where to set it. Um, and as you go and look at these jurisdictions or if you happen to be in one or if yours is coming next, because I promise you there'll be a bunch more in 2022, um, you may get there and you may find Dave McPherson and HDL are already there. Uh, they have a very close relationship to City Hall. Uh, HDL and Uni Services are basically bounty hunters. They've got a decades old relationship with cities where what they do is they come in and they say, hey, you know what, you can get the IRS and the FTB and all those tax records and we can compare them to your local business records because you know what, I bet you there's a bunch of little businesses that are paying taxes uh, but they're not paying a local business tax. You know, like little old ladies running babysitting services and preschools and, you know, people sewing at home. A lot of times it's like that. It's small home-based businesses that haven't paid the city, whatever, they're 60 bucks or whatever. And so they'll like crunch the data and go out and collect and then they get a cut. So they're bounty hunters, they're head hunters, and, you know, they've discovered cannabis and they're pushing it. And so... I'm sure that the panelists have had ex um, experience, you know, often the city will trust HDL. And so you're gonna have to work in that environment. So besides spewing um, viral and hatred about them, um, how do we work with them to get the best outcome um, in your locality regarding both the, the regulations and, and their weird competitive applications and setting that tax rate, somebody online mentioned uh, that they got uh, Oceanside agreed to start it at 4%. HDL had recommended 6%. I'd kind of like to hear from that person or let's start with the panelists. Well, I'll just jump in and say that the city of Indio, which is a really fairly large geographically for the Valley, is one of those cities working with HDL. And, and at this point, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna jump on that bandwagon and slag on anybody, but, uh, what it, it, to me, I'll take any which way I can get a city to start having these conversations about allowing cannabis, right? So I'll, I'll, I don't care how the foot's in the door. And then, you know, as we go to public meetings, we can get our hands for the most part on the documents provided by, right, HTL to write the analyses that are happening. We can get more than typically more than just the slides they're showing at a meeting, we can get the actual reports. And so we can kind of take a look and then by virtue of having a, a bunch of other cities who've been doing this for years, um, these guys might be late in or last in or whatever, but they can learn, right? And we can then come in and say, yes, this is a proposal that HDL has done for you that you've paid for, but here's some lessons that we've learned by being in and around this right industry from these other cities and how this has been done. And maybe you can take the, the, the better way uh, based on other real experience because a lot of cities jumped in early, they didn't know. I mean, and that's what you'll hear them say. They're like, well, we didn't know. So now we're gonna iterate and make it better. You know, the way that I deal with HDL is completely ignore them. Uh, we went straight to our local city in West Hollywood and got there before HDL even had an opportunity to get in the door. And we talked, we formed stakeholder groups and we worked closely with our local officials, uh, whether it was staff or electeds. And by the time that HDL wanted to get in and we were going to create this merit-based application process, there was no room for them. So if you don't want HDL in your community and you're in your local city, get there first and get these relationships happening with your locals because the only reason that they're getting the business is because you're not doing it because someone else isn't doing it because someone else hasn't gotten there first. So, you know, um, that, that's, that's kind of how I, how I deal with them, James. And, you know, I, I know that, um, you know, we were, 
able, because we didn't have a group like HDL in here sort of dominating on what the policy should be and how the process should go, we were able to kind of create our own process and we were certainly able to create our own ordinance and our own policies that we're gonna hopefully work for West Hollywood and for the community here as to what the, you know what uh, what we need. Like going back to uh, Jacob uh, who mentioned it about Truckee and, and North Lake Tahoe in his um, comments, one of the things he brought up was about tourism and you know understandably so with covid covid has sort of you know changed the game as it relates to tourism and fortunately the policies that we put in place like in back in west hollywood are amenable to a change we're spending a lot of time um, right now coming up with policies that are going to be covid friendly policies I don't think a group like HDL is going to be able to come in and do something like that. They're not close enough to each city and each locality to even know what's right for each community. So, um, you know, I, I hope that as we go down the line that we see more cities taking these things on without the help of a group such as HDL. I know there's others out there, but um, that's my recommendation is get there first. I think that's that's a great comment. I think getting there early is super important so that you can anchor the conversation. Um, if you are uh, relegated to a position where they have already engaged uh, a firm like that, they have already um, identified sort of what the policy points are that they're going to address, then you're negotiating against that position. And so you're already at a disadvantage. So it's really important to, to engage early, to engage often, um, and to have local stakeholders that, that are from the community that are the, the people that are generating the revenue for that community and are providing those head of household jobs where you can demonstrate the ripple effect for those businesses being present because the people doing that are there. That's what I found um, resonates so much. That's how we flipped Santa Rosa. Santa Rosa was really antagonistic to cannabis in 2015 and 20, um, the end of 2015 and 2016. They had a new city manager. We started talking about economic development. We brought in some of the local stakeholders and then they got it. They got that it was a monetary issue and they did not hire HDL or anyone like them. And it turned out that they really, as a city, kind of set the example of what good regulations can look like. Um, so I think it's really important to be able to do that and to have that kind of flexibility. Um, and then just you know, very quickly as to, to West Hollywood, the, the onsite consumption is so crucial. And that's one of the things that West Hollywood has done great, where almost every jurisdiction has done poorly. And what is not well understood, I don't think, is that under the, the regulations, you know, 26200G allows for on-site consumption for a retailer. The whole provision is like this long. It's not complicated. And it's just a basic alignment issue. So when you're dealing with the electeds, it's something you can frame as aligning with state law it's not complicated, but can make a huge difference. And it's something that I think should be replicated in other places, just like in Australia. You know, James, I mean, to, to address your question, um, I've dealt with SCI, I've dealt with community services, I've dealt with HDL. Of those three, I've only had one city. I, I've had no success with SCI, and no success with community services, and HDL at least gets ordinances passed. To, so to Jocelyn's point, um, and, and also to Jackie's, I mean, and Joe's, get in there if you can. But the problem is when Prop 64 passed, a lot of sort of these, these, this strength that the industry had kind of fell away like, oh, it's going to happen. Uh, so it's not as easy to get those activists out there who used to come out in wheelchairs and on their canes and their walkers and who used to really, you know, browbeat councils to get it done. That's not there anymore. And when there's a void, you get companies that come in that do this. And so... Uh, you know, that's the problem with, with, with the local activism. There's not enough of it. And so in the absence of that, we have, you know, the HDLs. And, and my experience has actually been pretty good, right? When you, when you, when you know it's going to rain, you just have to get an umbrella, right? You just have to deal with the circumstances that you're dealt with. And I just interact with them. And, I, you know, I try to push and push and push to make things work. I'll tell you what will happen if you don't have an HDL or some other company. And I, I don't endorse anybody but some other company is you will get the police departments trying to figure out how to make the policy. It's not going to be the city manager. That person has way too much to do already and, and, or the budget manager or anyone else, you're going to get PD in there 
Um, and they're going to be, oh my God, cannabis is the worst thing since, you know, uh, whatever. And you no, know, no, we don't want it. I, I've actually seen HDL push back on that issue and say, no, crime rates did not go up. And these are the cities where crime rates did not go up. We have the statistical data because they're pushing back on that. And so uh, there's got to be some advocacy there. Um, I, I've had this conversation many times with James and, and with Wes Hine from Mammoth Distribution. And we've talked about, we need to create a resource database for local activism, you know, give them the tools that they can log online and start their own local chapter of activists to start pushing councils to move this stuff on their own. But, but I've seen so many cities that try to do it on their own that fail miserably or processes that take years and years and years or processes that end up being so lopsided and biased because they're uh, trying to get their friends at dispensary. Uh, that that I'd almost rather have uh, some third party outside consultant come in and at least give cities, uh, you know, some set of standard facts that we can live by. I mean, um, it's, you know, it, it, all, it all goes back to the local control issue and, you know, you know dance with the devil that you know, uh, as opposed to just going out and dancing with some police chief. And, you know, we know how that's all going. Now, that, those are all really great points. And, um... Uh, you know, Jocelyn, your, your point about, okay, HDL is in there um, and they are providing staff reports, um, you know, private consultant analyses to city council. You can get those and you can kind of rebut some of the underlying assumptions. Uh, you can introduce the idea of competition between uh, neighboring jurisdictions uh, and you can, you can get to your um, your uh, uh, local elected or their staffers or local staff, which in most small cities, it's the city manager and the planning department and their staff, they're basically thinking these issues through and kind of presenting uh, options to city council, which are usually volunteers uh, who are looking to staff and city manager for, for direction and support and looking to, to um, consultants like HDL, but if you develop a relationship and a rapport there of sort of, you know, professional, informative, educate them, help them look good, um, you know, you, they can modify uh, what's what's put in, in front of them. Hey, James, one last point. Yeah. And I'll tell you, when HDL was doing the analysis for Redwood City, yeah. um, you know, they, they came out with one per 10,000 for concentration for dispensaries. Uh -huh. That's the ting bill. Right. That's actually a bill we all support. Yeah. So that's so good to hear. That that's I mean that that's where you will actually I could never make that argument and get laughed out of a room with a council member. But if somebody like an HDL or some other consulting company can make that argument and back it up with data and show that your larger market area can support this type of, of data and get them to think about larger revenue dollars for them, not just for yeah. me, right? Who's gonna be a cannabis guy that's going to tell them what they want to hear. That's an interesting thing, right? So to have yeah. Ting and yeah. HDL yeah. on the same page yeah. with concentration of licenses, right. at least they're moving in, in some direction, right? right. D Dave McPherson was on a panel not super long ago saying exactly that and showing the numbers of, you know, points of access that need to come up right and that the state's really lacking uh the other thing before we run out of time i really wanted to jump in because jackie always gets all the um everyone knows there's consumption allowed in west hollywood but there is consumption allowed in two of our cities in palm springs and in cathedral city and we have lounges and while we were and are hard hit uh from covid and tourism they're building more and they're going to be beautiful. So come down and do your can of tourism in the Coachella Valley. <laughs> That's, I want to go into um, consumption. I want to go to Jackie just to, to wrap up this thing with how do we deal with local government and in the HDL context, if, if necessary, which it so often is. I, I am always in favor of at least, and especially in a small, relatively conservative city, making the pitch that um, competitive application processes for a limited number of, of permits are unnecessary, especially for supply chain. If they're freaked out about storefront dispensaries, fine, set that to the side. But for supply chain where the market is the entire state, um, why does it make sense for the government to pick winners? 
right? Most of these people are property rights people. They may be Republicans. They believe in the market. So let's let the market work. You've got this is what zoning is for. You pick the appropriate zoning, you don't need a conditional use permit, right? If it's an industrial activity, manufacturing, indoor cultivation, distribution, you just set the zoning and then you issue the permits to whoever is qualified. And if they can make money, great. They'll pay revenue, they'll pay rent, they'll provide jobs. And if they can't, they'll go out of business. And that's how you pick the number. And that's how you have a very simple application process. And it is absolutely worth making that argument, especially in that kind of relatively conservative uh, context, because that, that, you know, let the market decide argument um, will, um, it, it, it will resonate. We've got state level, uh, 429 pages of state level administrative regulations. You know, we, we can do this. Um, let's hear about uh, consumption. And then I think we're gonna be ready for our next panel. Uh, Jackie, you've seen, you're seeing some questions. Um, where do we go? Uh, well, just really quickly to touch on what you just said about the, the, the application process. I would just say here in West Hollywood, if we didn't have a merit-based application process, we might've ended up with eight MedMeds instead of one. So I just wanna kind of put, float that out there to think about, um, cause corporate money would have definitely taken over the process. So flawed or not, I think it was a better situation that we had an, uh, a, a merit-based process here in West Hollywood. I, I think storefront retail is-, is Because in West Hollywood is limited, there's no supply chain here, zero. It's all retail and lounge. So, um, and on that lounge question, uh, while we only have a minute or two here, um, just I want to separate out something for everybody so they really clearly understand. There's two lounge models that are going on here. The lounge model that was, uh, I forget, was maybe Sean talked about in, um, or Joe talked about in, um, that's in statute in section 26200G is basically saying if you have a retail license, a state retail license, your local jurisdiction can give you a permit for um, on-site consumption that's attached to that retail license. It's not going to be necessarily a separate uh, premises might be a same premises, but nevertheless, it's based around a retail model. That's the model that exists in statute. Why is West Hollywood different? West Hollywood decided that based on the tourism here that we needed standalone lounges. So, so, so we have retail model, we have retail plus lounge model, and we have standalone lounges, which is what I've got that don't have a retail license. So we can transact on site. We can sell people, of course, product for con on site consumption, but we're not a store, we're not a dispensary. And so that's why we went about it that way. And again, that is very unique to West Hollywood. Not every city is going to want such a thing, but in the case of WeHo, it just makes more sense to have, to have that standalone model um, that can just be a destination all by itself. Um, and just for what it's worth, the reason that we had to go to ballot measure earlier this year was because there's there's a combination of local policies that were preventing our viability and then there's state issues in the regulations that are also challenging to us including being able to serve regular food and beverage not infused food and beverage so for a lounge that was standalone that wanted to be like a restaurant kind of a cafe experience with a lounge um we we can't actually do that legally yet without having two premises side by side. So these are some of the policies that we're working on right now. And, um, you know, and I, again, I think that we might not have ever come up with that sort of solution had we gone down the path of having a third party, um, you know, create our ordinance. And um, the fact that we, the stakeholders right here in West Hollywood, kind of really helped develop that ordinance, I think is, is was good. And it, and it landed us here and it's been challenging, but now we're on go. And that section in name policy of not allowing for non-infused food and beverages uh, into that, that type of lounge facility. Um, so I, I don't understand why that policy exists um, at all, but it, it is the policy. Um, one, one brief comment is that one of the, the cool things about um, section 26200 is that the, where you domicile that retail facility that has on-site consumption you can be very creative with, and that's up to the localities. So you can domicile that in hospitality. You can have, for example, a hotel that local land use regulations allow for you to co-domicile a, a retail establishment there with on-site consumption. There's a lot of different iterations of that that are possible that can be really innovative. And that's actually one of the things that we're pushing for here 
in Sonoma County to kind of add to that, that experience. And we have some traction with the electeds on it. So it's possible that, that we may start seeing some of those more creative models for consumption to, to come up. Um, and it's something that I would just advocate for people to look at replicating in their, their hometown because it's fully possible under state law. It's just a, what, a matter of whether the electeds are willing to do it. And, and, and really quick, uh, I just want to answer your question, why that policy is there. The reason that that regulation was in place to prevent food and beverage had nothing to do with lounges. It was intended for retailers to not become 7-Eleven. So that is why that was there. But there's an unintended consequence for the, the lounges. So we're working on fixing that actually right now. And we're hoping we just got the, the uh, BCC's Cannabis Advisory Committee to agree and vote to move that forward. And hopefully we'll see that in the draft regulations that come out this summer. That's our hope. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, I'm going to give David Hua back his wonderful um, online gathering, and I'm going to thank the, the panelists um, and the participants. I'm really looking forward to getting a copy of this chat stream. Thank you so much uh, for all of your contributions there.